Hey, geeks and geekettes, it's time for another uh, episode of Ask Chuck Dixon, where you ask me questions about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living is I write comic books. Let's get right to it, shall we? Kenneth Ng, how do you find inspiration to write new characters and keep them interesting? Uh, you know, try to vary the settings. Uh, try to think of, um, you know, try to think differently than I have about other characters. Uh, find inspiration in real life. Um, build characters that suit the situations that I want them to be in. In other words, populate the story with the people necessary to move the story forward. Now, currently, uh, I'm doing a lot of work on a digital comic for Arctoons called My Sister Suprema. And as I've told you many times, you can check this out for free at Arctoons. Uh, it's uh, by me and Anthony Gonzalez Clark. And um, it's a sibling rivalry comedy, basically. It's a parody on the superhero genre. It's about a little boy named Randy Diaz, who is uh, a comic book fan. He dreams of being a superhero. He just doesn't want to read about them. He finds this mysterious website that offers uh, up uh, schematics and chemical equations that guarantee that you'll turn into a superhero, that you'll gain superpowers if you follow the directions carefully. And he does. Unfortunately for him, the subject of the experimentation turns out to be his older sister, Cecilia, rather than himself. She gets the superpowers, has no interest in being a superhero, and she, um, so he has to live vicariously through his big sister. Hence the sibling rivalry, there's a lot of envy, a lot of jealousy, and Cecilia is reluctant to become a superhero. She has no interest in it, uh, and Randy's constantly pushing her, which any big sister would resent from her little brother. I, I set the stories in Central Florida because I'd never seen a superhero comic book regularly set in Florida, and now, now I'll get 16 comments saying, well, there was, you know... <laughs> Captain Everglades uh, in you know 1979. Uh, okay, I'm sure there have been superhero comics set in Florida. I'm just unaware of them. Uh, so I set it in, in Florida, and I made the cast, the, the core family, the nuclear family that, that have these adventures, I made them of Latino descent, or the Diaz family. Uh, and they're, they're, they're either Puerto Rican or Cuban. Or, it doesn't matter because I don't, it's not intrinsic to the story that they're, Hispanic or Latino. I'm not doing anything stereotypical here. I just thought it made for a more interesting uh, cast of characters. One we don't see very often in comic books. And uh, Cecilia, let's go back to Cecilia. She's a typical teenage girl. She's bullheaded. She's self-interested. <laughs> she's, she's mostly worried about whether boys will like her. And uh, she fears embarrassment more than anything else in her life. She doesn't you know, teenage girls don't necessarily want to be the center of attention. They want to be the center of a boy's attention, but not the general center of attention, unless they're extreme extroverts, and Cecilia is not. She's just a your normal, average, self-involved American teenager. Her mom is a bit more high-strung. <laughs> uh, and... You know, I draw this character kind of from very from various sources in my life. The dad is, to, to some degree, based on me uh, because he doesn't get involved. I'm, I'm not Latino descent. And like I said, their descent is not important in the story. This isn't a, this isn't a, a push for diversity or anything like that. I, I created this series like 15 years ago. I just didn't get around to doing it till now. And it's pretty much unchanged from the way I originally imagined it. So long before you know, all of this nonsense going on the last couple of years. I, I was settled on Central Florida, Hispanic family. Um, anyway, the dad, you know, he doesn't like to get involved a lot. He likes to keep to himself. <laughs> unless it's directly involved. Unless you borrow his tools. And, and then he's, he's not happy about that. So, you know, I created a, a parental units that I could relate to. And Randy, the little brother, you know, he's maybe four or five years younger than his sister, He's um, pretty much based on me. Uh, you know, I was the last kid in the family. I had two older sisters. They were teenagers when I was, you know, still a, still a little kid. And uh, so I got to kind of like peek into that whole world 
of what teenage girls were like, you know, I was a fly on the wall kind of thing. And I've drawn a lot of inspiration from that over the years. My, my sisters were, you know, were and are, um, you know, very vivid characters in their own right. And uh, Cecilia is mostly based on my, my next oldest sister, uh, kind of a taking care of business kind of character. Uh, stubborn. You know, likes to win arguments. So, uh, so that's what's, it's basically what you do, you know, you, you come up with a concept, then you've got to do the characters to fit it. Now, that's what I did with My Sister Suprema. I wanted a sibling rivalry comedy that involves superheroes. But then I had to create characters that basically, they drive the story, their reactions to things, because this whole world is new to them, and we're new to the world with them. And so their reactions as characters are key as I build them. So you learn from the characters as they do things, you know, as they're presented with stimuli or challenges or dangers <clears throat> or whatever, any kind of problems, and how do they deal with them. And that's how the character builds over time and becomes more familiar to you. And so I've got to deal with, you know, making that character come alive in the reader's mind. Of course, I've got to make it come alive in my mind first. And... Uh, not, not real sure how I do that. It's just something that I do. I, I, I can't give you any pointers except always think about what the character wants. What, what are the character's goals? What do they want for themselves? And that's where a story like My Sister Suprema works perfectly because Randy's uh, wants and desires are in direct polar opposite of his sister's. She does not want fame. She does not want to be a superhero. She does not want to be the idol of millions. She just wants to you know, get through high school and go to college and meet a boy. <laughs> that's her goal in life. And becoming a superhero is going to interfere with all of that. And that's the source of the frustration and struggle and conflict within the story. Um, and, I mean, I could do this story for years and never introduce supervillains, never actually get to the superhero stuff. It could be this, like, never-ending origin story. It's not going to be that. She's going to have a continuing, evolving origin. It's not going to be... You know, the origin arc is over and now the adventures begin. It's very much going to be a blending of the two. And that's because it's character driven. And, um, you know, inspiration for those characters is necessity. I need characters that can move the story forward. So I create and build characters who move the story forward, who keep the plot moving and are interesting and funny or interesting and imposing, you know, for whatever reason. Whatever need they whatever need I need those characters to fill, that's what they're going to fill. But of course, I've got to write it in such a way that it doesn't seem mechanical like that. And I, I never see it as mechanical. It's an organic process. These characters grow in my mind. They take on a life in my mind long before I start writing them. And I feel like I understand them. I feel like I've met them. I feel like I know them. And, and that's really what it's all about. And however you get there, you get there. Some writers, as I've said before, will write lengthy biographies of their characters. They'll write Lots of material will never actually appear in the finished project, but it informs them about the character. They're, they're thinking on paper uh, or they're thinking out loud. I pre prefer to build the characters as I go and because to me it presents more of a surprise. There's no right way or wrong way. That's just the way I do it. So, Ryan Howard. Like many comic book fans, I'm also a huge fan of Dungeons and Dragons. I've heard stories about Marvel staffers playing D&D on their lunch breaks and Ike Perlmutter trying to stop that in the late 90s. I, I never heard that. But did the same thing happen in the DC offices? Did any of the freelancers have games together? Did you ever play or enjoy playing D&D? Did Denny ever play? The idea of Denny playing Dungeons and Dragons makes me laugh. Uh, <laughs> uh, Denny's game was Texas Hold'em. Possibly five card stud. And uh, the only games I ever played with other people at DC were poker. And it involved money. <laughs> so uh, if we went to a bat summit, at the end of the day, a lot of times we would head on down to the rec room at the resort and uh, play a few hands. And uh, if Denny's wife, Mary Fran, showed up, we, we all left with empty pockets because Mary Fran was just the nicest, sweetest person you'd ever want to meet. But she was a mechanic when you put a deck of cards in her hand uh she just she would wipe us out you know with a smile you know and you, you couldn't dislike her she's a wonderful woman and uh but boy you know you did not want to play poker against her she had the perfect poker face she she smiled all the time <laughs> it never varied she just seemed cheery and perky and bright throughout the entire game so you couldn't get a read on her 
and uh, killer poker player, killer bluffer. And, uh, but that's the only games we played. But the thing is, Dungeons and Dragons sort of, sort of had a Venn diagram of comics there in the 80s and the early 90s. Um, there, as far as I know, there weren't a whole lot of gaming conventions. So, um, you know, the people selling games and selling miniatures and the artists who did the artwork and everything else would show up at comic book conventions to, to hawk their wares. So a lot of times you, you know, you got to know these people because they were in sort of a related field. And a lot of comic book people worked in, in Dungeons and Dragons as well, doing illustrations. Um, so, you know, going to conventions and stuff, I mean, I got, I got to meet and know Larry Elmore. Uh, he even worked, he was interested in comics. He, he even did an Airboy one-shot with me, the Air Maidens, uh, that I really liked. I mean, he did, a, he did a hell of a job on it. And we talked about other comic projects that, that never came to fruition. But if you know Dungeons and Dragons, you know Larry Elmore. I mean, one of the great painters. One, one of the other great painters, Keith Parkinson, involved with TSR. And um, I got to know him at conventions, and then he moved to uh, not far from where I was living. So I, I saw him uh, quite a few times socially, but uh, never had an interest in the game. Uh, it, it was not anything that attracted me. I think it was the fantasy element. If Dungeons and Dragons had a World War II theme, I probably would have been a lot more attracted to it. But I'm not a huge fantasy fan. So when you start talking about goblins and orcs and elves, you lose me. And, and, and so I just, I, I didn't get it. And I didn't get involved with it. Um, another connection I had to it personally was uh, Flynn Henry uh, designed a lot of miniature figures for Ral Partha, a, a company that you know created, actually, I guess still creates uh, role-playing figures. And he did a lot of you know, he would he would do uh, turnarounds and character drawings and stuff like that. Uh, and um, often a, another guy we knew, John Dennett. Would, would turn them, he was a sculptor, would turn them into the miniatures from Flint's wacky drawings. So that's really the only connection I had to Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I, I don't know anybody at DC that played Dungeons and Dragons, and I never saw anybody playing Dungeons and Dragons at Marvel at lunchtime. I also never saw Ike Perlmutter in the bullpen. Uh, the bullpen in the 90s at Marvel was a beehive. It was so freaking busy. I never saw anybody doing anything other than working or eating lunch at their desk or eating the lunch while they were working. I mean, it was a busy, busy place. And I can't imagine anybody setting up a, a you know, a Dungeons and Dragons game. I mean, maybe it happened a couple of times, but I imagine it got quashed pretty quick. And I was up there a lot of times. I mean, during the day, I was in the middle of the working environment and I just never saw anything like that. The only extracurricular activity I had at DC was a lot of us would go down to Chinatown to see the latest Hong Kong action film. Um, the, all the bad guys, Scott Peterson, Darren Vincenzo, Jordan Gorfinkel, um, you know, would we, we'd go down and watch the latest Jackie Chan or Chow Yun-Fat or Jet Li movie. And, you know, and I, I went every opportunity I had because at the time they were hard, you know, the, there were no DVDs yet. The laser discs were really expensive. Sometimes you could find them on bootleg v videos, but obviously the best place to see them was you know, in a Chinatown theater on the big screen. And I remember, I think Drunken Master 2, I think, um, I think I remember Denny came along with us for that one. Uh, and I think he came along for one other Jackie Chan film. Um, Rumble in the Bronx. Right? Yeah, yeah, Denny came with us to see that as well. Because, uh, you know, Denny obviously was a big Kung Fu movie fan. So, um, yeah, that's the only time I remember you know, us doing anything other than playing poker at summits. Jeremy Seaton. I loved your work on Claw the Unconquered. It actually ranks as one of my favorite comics of all time. Old saying of mine, every comic is someone's favorite. Every comic is some store's number one bestseller. Okay. But it seems as if you weren't given the time to fully develop the storylines you were building. It couldn't have been your original idea from the start to have the forces of evil enter Pathari and enslave humanity as ends up happening. Could it? Yeah, it was. As a Claw fan, that ending has always haunted me. Well, you know, I'm sorry it haunted you, but I'm also proud that I wrote something that would haunt you. It's not easy to do. Another old saying of mine is, uh, I used to torture my characters, now I torture my readers. Uh, you kind of got to be cruel to your readers sometimes, you know, to keep their attention, keep them involved. Um, okay. 
uh, I also wondered if the female protagonist, who was raped by the evil version of Claw and carried in her the souls of the Knights of the Iron Circle, was really originally intended to meet such a grisly fate after all that buildup. Anyway, as a huge fan of both the original series and your brilliant take on it, I'd just love to hear any thoughts or recollections you have about the series. Well, I was assigned to write it, and Claw of the Unconquered was, you know, let's face it, uh, he was an attempt in the 70s for DC to get on the Conan train, because Marvel was having so much success with Conan, both in comics and magazines. I guess DC thought, well, let's, let's get a piece of the barbarian action. And they came up with Claw, who's very much a Conan knockoff. I mean, he looks very much like Conan, except for that crazy Claw. Um, so I was handed it, and, and the beauty of Claw the Unconquered is, is that um, he wasn't based on an iconic, uh, revered fantasy character, you know, from another time period. Uh, so he was pretty much open to anything I wanted to do with him. I mean, I did things with Claw I could never have been allowed to do or would want to do with Conan. Uh, so I came up with a, I said, well, how can this be different from a normal Conan story? Well, what if the first six issue arc, which will be the first trade, because that's what we were doing then, we still are writing for the trades. Uh, what if he lost? What if the unimaginable fate that he was trying to avoid happened and he was defeated? It's particularly tempting because since he's Claw the Unconquered, well, what if the story ends with him being conquered, enslaved, taken away to an alien dimension? What if the usual worst fate that could face the hero in any heroic fantasy story happened to Claw? And the plan was I was going to do another six issue arc called Claw the Conquered, which would have shown him, you know, imprisoned in this, you know, Lovecraftian, horrific hellscape of a world uh, and and yet and he would triumph against all odds he would find allies and find the means to you know claw his way back to prominence and either dominate that dimension or escape from it and uh, he would regain his um, status as claw the unconquered and then I planned a third uh, six issue arc that would you know complete a trilogy and that would be called, you know, Claw Victorious, Claw Triumphant, whatever. You know, so he would win in the end. But unfortunately, you know, that didn't happen. So you're stuck with this downer ending, which haunts you to this day, uh, which I'll take credit for. So, you know, sorry, no more Claw, unless, you know, somebody at DC sees this and thinks, hey, let's let Chuck finish that. And the odds of that are... Slim to none, and uh, none just left town, as they say. So let's move on to our next question. Dara Clancy, growing up in the 90s reading your Punisher, one of my favorite characters was Mickey Fandazi from The War Zone. He reminds me of a character from the British sitcom Only Fools and Horses called Del Boy. Each time Frank needs his help, Mickey is up to his latest harebrained scheme, whether it's pirating videotapes, untaxed cigarettes, or skimming credit cards. Frank often threatens to do him either death or grievous harm. The next time they meet, Mickey's up to another scam. The boy never learns. Question is, how bad does a guy have to be for Frank Castle to shoot him? As an authority on the subject, the Punisher, what's the line in your opinion? Um, Punisher doesn't make a lot of friends. He doesn't make friends easily. And even when he does, they're not really his friends. They may think he is. He's their friend, but he's not. He's using them. They're allies. And, of course, he makes a lot of enemies, and they usually die by the end of the book. So building a supporting cast for Frank Castle is, is a challenge uh, to, to make it believable. And um, when we started Punisher Warzone, it was very much a collaborative effort between Don Daly, and Johnny Romita Jr., and I, and a number of other people that were on Marvel staff who wanted to be in on it. Because we felt it would be a big book, and it was. It was a big book. Um, it was a brand new Punisher number one at the height of speculation, and Johnny was going to be drawing it. Um, going in, Johnny said he wanted to lean into the fact that Frank Castle was Italian. I thought, well, that's cool. I like that idea. He's Italian. He's from Brooklyn. And I said, why don't we uh, have him go undercover in the mob? That would, you know, that would check all the boxes we need here. He'd have to, he'd have to really be an Italian from Brooklyn to convince these guys. And that's what we did. 
so he you know he goes in the mob he, you know, he gets a ponytail <laughs> gets some gets some tailored suits and he, he joins the mob and that was the story for the first arc of Warzone it was highly popular sold in the millions but the biggest selling comic I ever worked on was this one um, and uh, all that was cool so one of the opportunities I wanted to take was to introduce a uh, sort of confidential informant an ally a reluctant ally within uh, the uh, Carbone family that he infiltrates. And so Frank finds Mickey Fandazi. And Mickey Fandazi is Albanian. He's part of the family. He's part of one of the crews. But he's Albanian. He's not Italian. So he's never going to be a made man. He's never going to run a crew. He's never going to get much further than what he is, which is a foot soldier. And he's not even really good at that because he's a big coward. Uh, and Frank realizes this guy's weak. I can use him. Because that's the basis of every relationship Frank Castle has. How can I use this person? And he sees Mickey as somebody he can manipulate. And if he just scares him enough. And he scares him in probably the most famous scene I wrote for The Punisher. The torture sequence in which Frank makes Mickey believes he, believe that he's being tortured with an acetylene torch. Uh, when actually it's a popsicle. Uh, and if you've never read this scene, it's in Punisher, I believe it's in Punisher Warzone number one. It's also faithfully reproduced in the Thomas Jane Punisher uh, movie. You know, panel by panel, line by line, it's exactly like it was in the comic. And uh, it's mostly a scene that I did because uh, I, I wanted Frank to get information out of a guy, but Frank would not stoop to torture, in my mind. Uh, he's not a sadist. Uh, so he wanted to make Mickey believe he was being tortured without actually harming him. And so Mickey becomes, you know, confidential informant, uh, re reluctant buddy to, uh, to Frank. But because Mickey can never be a made man, uh, he's always got side hustles trying to make money. He's never going to run a crew or anything, but he's got side hustles, you know, like smuggling cigarettes and things like that. But Frank doesn't care about those crimes. Frank doesn't really care about crime. Uh, like a, a law enforcement person would. He doesn't care if you break, you know, some civil code or you play your radio loud at night. Uh, he doesn't care about that stuff. Uh, he cares about crimes that hurt other people. And to Frank Castle, who's a pretty pragmatic guy, he doesn't see smuggling cigarettes, uh, you know, New York State doing, doing without a little bit of tax money. He doesn't really see that as a crime. Same thing for bootlegging videos. What does Frank care about the FBI? FBI warning at the beginning of a VHS tape and um, um, you know skimming credit cards you know it's low level stuff you're not you know nobody's getting killed there's no blood spill uh, so he lets Mickey go on because he can use Mickey and even after this arc uh, he continues to associate with Mickey to one degree or another but you know Mickey's a um, he's a useful character for the Punisher the inspiration, his name comes from a guy I know or knew uh, when I worked security. And he's, this guy's nothing like Mickey Fandazi. There's a guy named Ray Fondatz. And uh, he was Albanian, but he told me once that his great grandparents, when they arrived at Ellis Island, you know, their name was Fandazi. It wasn't Fondatz. I thought, wow, what a cool name. I am going to use that name sometime. And so he did. And, and it all fit in with this story that. Because Mickey is fun, he's of Albanian descent, Campion Italian. That's why he's never going to be at the core of the mob. That's why he's not so, you know, it isn't so hard for him to betray the Carbones because they, what have they ever done for him? He's very much an opportunist. But um, but thanks to Ray Fondatz for telling me that and basically inspiring the character. But like I say, Ray was nothing like him. We work security. Ray was a like linebacker, big guy. And if, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big guy myself, but I always wanted Ray with me if there was somebody that needed to be confronted on a parking lot or whatnot. And uh, I got to know a lot about him. When you work security, when you work graveyard shift <laughs> at an insurance company campus way out in the middle of nowhere, you, there's never any trouble. I mean, we never had any real trouble. So you, so you do a lot of talking. There's a lot of socializing. You get to know your, your, uh, your guys pretty well. And uh, I, always, I, I always enjoyed hanging with Ray. He was, he was a good dude. Now, as far as Del Boy uh, from uh, Only Fools and Horses, I'm, I'm familiar with the show, but I, but I only saw it like 10 years ago, long after I created Mickey Fondazi. 
And and Del Boy is he's very much like Mickey. He's a scamster. You know, he's if you've never seen the show, it's a terrific comedy, extraordinarily popular in England at the time. Uh, it's kind of like their Seinfeld. Just people quote it all the time. The most famous quote from Del Boy is, "This time next year we'll be millionaires." And he's always coming up with quick buck schemes and scams. You know, just outside the law. You know, uh, the only difference between Mickey and Del Boy, I don't think Del Boy was a coward. Um, you know, he was. You know, he'd get into it. Didn't run away from a fight uh, that I recall. A more direct inspiration, um, intentional maybe on my part, but certainly I must have had him in mind when I created Mickey, was Angel from Rockford Files. Um, Angel, if you've never seen the show, was uh, Jim Rockford's, at one time was Jim Rockford's cellmate. And somewhere in the series, um, in the first season, um, Angel is released and he goes to Jim Rockford like, for a hand up, you know, to help him out. My old cellmate, but Rockford's never happy to see him. Um, like Mickey, Angel's very much a scamster, quick buck. You know, he's amoral. He's never violent. He is an abject coward uh, and a user. And he, he basically uses Rockford all the time for alibis, excuses, and, and help him out with scams. He's always getting Rockford into more trouble than Rockford expected to get into. And I think Rockford looks at him like a pet. I don't think he, you know, uh, maybe at some point in Angel's mind, he did he did Rockford a favor when they were in prison and he feels Rockford owes him. I don't think, I think Jim thinks he's repaid the, uh, the debt in spades and it wishes Angel would go away. Doesn't wish harm to Angel or anything else. So it's not really like the Punisher relationship, but it is in that they're not really friends because Angel would betray Rockford in a second. And, and Jim would probably be happier if, if, you know, Angel got hauled away to a low security uh, facility for a while and get him out of his hair. So, so there you go, the origin of Mickey Fandazzi. Phantom Mercenary, the character of Azrael, Jean-Paul Vallée, was slowly diminished from the end of Nightfall and Night Quest to the character's death around 1999-2000. Was this due to DC not really knowing what to do with JPV after Nightfall concluded? Or was this due to his co-creator being Joe Casada and his promotion to Marvel Comics editor in 2000? A way to stick it to the competition. DC and Marvel never had that kind of rivalry. They've never had that kind of... They, you know, they may act like boxers that are way in in public, but in private, they all know each other. You know, currently, you know, well, until Dan DeDio left DC... You know, both companies were run by guys that lived in the same neighborhood, went to the same comic shop. Uh, back in the day, you know, Stan Lee and Carmen and Fatino, they can't stand each other. Yeah, not really. I mean, I, th I think Stan and Carmen's wives were friends. I mean, they went out to dinner all the time. I don't know if they went to cruises together, but I always heard they went to, like, Broadway shows together. I mean, they socialized, you know. Um, you know, DC was always envious of Marvel's success and kind of, like, shocked by Marvel's success. That's why it took them so long to react to it. But, you know, there was never that kind of thing. These DC wouldn't be that petty because uh, they might want Joe come come back, work for them someday. So, uh, you know, they kept a friendly rivalry. As far as Azrael, I mean, his story is over for the most part as far as Batman fans are interested at the end of Nightfall. Uh, they don't really want to see this guy ever again. <laughs> Batman fans did not take to... Jean-Paul Valley, particularly as Batman, uh, to the point where, as I've said before, our sales plummeted. We, we had to end Jean-Paul Valley's portion of Nightfall six months earlier than planned because he was affecting sales. Fans didn't like him. They didn't like him being Batman. Uh, they they might have thought he was really cool as Azrael. They did not like him as Batman. So when he leaves the Batman circle, when he leaves the Batman family, he's walks out of the bat cave into the sunshine, returns to being Azrael, returns to being the sort of messed up, guilt-ridden, um, you know, unhinged kind of character he's always been. You know, always trying to do right, but never doing it in the right way. And all of that was cool. Uh, and he had his own 100-issue run. But here's the dirty little secret. And admit it, you come to ask Chuck Dixon for the dirty little secret. The 100-issue run of Azrael, which was written entirely by Denny O'Neill, was part of Denny O'Neill's retirement plan. It was agreed that at the end of Night's End, 
night nightfall and well at the end of night time which made a lot of money for dc it was highly profitable denny's payback for coming up with that and, and hurting the cats to get it all done uh you know a mighty task by by anybody's estimation Part of his reward was that he would beget an Azrael solo ongoing series that would run for 100 issues and could not be canceled. And, it, and so Denny began it just before retiring and then continued to write it uh, after he retired. And so that was kind of a built-in little nest egg, a little golden parachute that he worked out uh, with the powers that be at the time at DC. And DC's full of these kind of deals. I, I never saw this kind of stuff at Marvel, but DC had like a weird, um, only the Irish kept secrets the way DC does. Um, they, maybe Sicilians keep secrets the way, but they, they would have these secret handshake, gentlemen's agreement kind of deals, you know, probably done over lunches. Uh, and, and nobody was privy to, I was privy to this one because Danny told me about it. But, but you know, we, we wouldn't know. There'd be a lot of unanswerable questions. The one that always bothered me, continues to bother me to this day, is at Bat Summits, you know, we would be looking, you know, we were, we're exploring the Batman universe. We're bringing everything in. We're throwing everything but the kitchen sink at these events. And not only me, but the other writers, Doug and Alan, would say, this would be a good place we could use the Wraith. And Denny would be, no, 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 you can't use the Wraith. Nobody can use the Wraith. <laughs> And I'm like, it's created by Michael Barr, first drawn by Michael Golden. What's the hook here? Why can't we use the Wraith? You know, what, you know, is there like some agreement signed in blood? Well, there must have been because we were never allowed to use the Wraith and we were never told why. And to this day, I don't know why. And there were things like that all the time you would run into at DC. Well, I want to use this character. I want to do, can't, oh, no, you can't do that. <laughs> why not? Oh, you know, well, you know, and they changed the subject. You know, how about lunch? <laughs> So um, anyway, there you go. That's the that's everything I know about Azrael. In a nutshell, Daniel Jackowitz, quick follow up question about Tim Drake being Jewish. You said you wrote him with his Jewish faith culture in mind. How did you include that piece into the character without being direct about it? I never picked it up. So I'd love to hear you describe your process even more. We well, never picked it up because I never really addressed it. In my mind, he was Jewish. And the reason for this is because. Um, one of the bad editors, Jordan B. Gorfinkel, uh, is Jewish. He's, he's very um, dedicated. Uh, you know, he's um, very serious about his faith, which I, I always found impressive. That's the, 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 the level of dedication because it's not easy. You know, um, it's not an easy religion to follow. Uh, there's a lot of rules, a lot of, you know, that, that in, in your daily life. And, and he was, um, you know, he was strict about it. And he once told me that uh, the one thing about comics that disappointed him, he loved comic books, the one thing that disappointed him was he, if he liked a character and he really felt like he could relate to this character, uh, and then they would go to church you know, or celebrate Christmas, you know, and then he would realize, oh, that they can't be Jewish. You know? And the thing about superheroes, more so than any other fictional characters, is that we tend to project ourselves on them. We read them as kids and they're wish fulfillment characters. We see ourselves flying. We see ourselves in that, you know, we wish that we were those characters. Um, and, you know, anybody who's read comics has that, you know, where I, I wish I could fly. I wish I was strong like that or brave like that. Or, you know, um, you know, even today, I, you know, I envy Wolverine because when I'm opening packages, <laughs> How cool would it be to just have a ready set of razor sharp claws? Uh, so when Jordan said that, I began to think about it. And I looked back over Tim Drake's history as written by Marv Wolfman, as written by Alan Grant, and as written by myself up to that point. I realized there's nothing here that would contradict that Tim might be Jewish or could be Jewish. I mean, he could be a Hindu. He could be a Buddhist. We don't know. I thought, well, I'm never going to write anything that contradicts that. I'm never going to show him celebrating Christmas. I'm never going to show him going to church. I'm never going to do anything interesting. I'm going to, in my mind, the Drakes are non-practicing Jews, uh, as so many are. And that's where I went with it. And so the fact that you didn't pick up on it, well, of course you didn't, because it, it wasn't there. There was nothing there to pick up on. And that was the point. And, and, and 
not just about the character being Jewish, but, but about the character being anything. It really made me think about how we project on these characters. And so when I write superheroes, I don't include things that aren't necessary. Like I mentioned, Frank Castle, he's a he's an Italian, he's Catholic. It's part of his character. You know, okay, that's baked into Punisher. But it's it's not with other characters. Um, so, I mean, I mentioned my sister Suprema earlier. I mean, there's no reason to believe that they might not be Cuban Jews. I mean, I'm not going to address it either way. It's, it's just not important to the story. Who cares? You know, when you think about it, think about, all you know, what Space Ghost religion? Who cares? <laughs> difference does make? doesn't make any difference to the story. It doesn't add or take away that we don't know that. But it lets you pretend you're a space ghost, no matter who you are. Dara O'Sullivan, you said in your earlier videos you'd like to write Judge Dredd, but the powers that be in 2000 AD would only allow British writers to do so, and the occasional Canadian, Irishman, Scotsman. Is there any Welsh writers that write? For, I don't know. Or Australian writers? They're all part of the Commonwealth. Um, anyway, only British writers would be allowed that. Uh, what is your favorite Dread story? And if that embargo was ever lifted and you got a chance to write Dread, what elements, characters, and villains would you feature in your story? Um, I've read a lot of Dread. I can't really pick out a favorite. I mean, you know, the typical, the, the tight boot story, you know, comes to mind. Um, some of the earlier stuff that, that Balin did, uh, the Cursed Earth story, the Judge Child stuff. And then stuff, you know, I, I've, re I've read recently. There, I read one recently. I can't remember the title of it, but there's a, a virus loose in um, in Mega City One. I, I thought that was a really cool story. Um, but you know, I just I just I just like Dread overall, um, and I, and I appreciate the fact that it's a parody of the United States. It's what it's it's the Brits taking everything they know or don't know about Americans and extrapolating it to absurdity. Uh, but we're we got big shoulders. We can we can we can be we can be poked fun at, especially when it's as cool uh, as a character as Judge Dredd. Um, if I wrote a story, I'm not going to write one right here. I mean, I did propose when IDW got the series, I did do a pitch, which I couldn't find. I tried to find for this broadcast to remind me of what I had pitched. Could not find it. Uh, but then, you know, I got turned down because they wanted an American, or they wanted a, a, a Brit, um, somebody with an accent different than mine to, to write the series. Uh, but I would definitely, it would definitely involve Judge Hershey because I, I love the Judge Hershey character and uh, it would definitely involve Block Wars. Uh, and that fascinates the hell out of me. Uh, I mean, the, 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 <clears throat> the uh, Carl Urban Dread movie, I mean, it's a Block War movie. For the most, there's, there's not two blocks at war with each other, it's a block at war with itself. And I think that's really cool, a sort of claustrophobic interior, windowless, you know, combat arena that's pretty much endless. You know, and these buildings that are hundreds of stories tall, filled with miscreants and filled with lots of innocence and danger and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I could get into that. I mean, and probably, you know, I mean, just thinking off the top of my head, do a block war story where there's some sort of malignant influence, some mystery to be solved along with all the, the bloodshed and, and gun battles in the hallways and stuff like that. That There's some overall thing that, you know, Dredd realizes that something is not right here. There's something afoot. Something's behind this. This isn't like a normal block war. This and and if we don't stop it here, it's going to spread to all of Mega City One, and so they have to uncover this uh, malignant um, uh, alien presence or whatever, you know, so that they can win the day and once again bring order to uh, to chaos. So if that makes any sense at all, David Jordan. Are you familiar with the French OSS 117 spy novels? What do you, or, or movies, what do you think of them? Um, yeah, OSS 117 was a series of, like James Bond knockoffs the French did in the early 60s. And yeah, I've, I've seen all five of them. And I, I enjoyed them. I thought they were fun. They're lower budget than the Bond films, but they got a lot of the same Bond f feel. And they've got that French Elan, even though, um, uh, OSS 117 is, is an American, sometimes played by an American. Here he's played by Kerwin Matthews. Um, it's, um, you know, it, it's got all the thrills and spills and, and, you know, beautiful women and dangerous situations. And he does travel around the world 
uh, the way Bond does. But generally, he only goes to one location because, like I said, the budget's lower. So he goes to Japan, he goes to uh, South America and places like that. And um, they're cool. And the music's real, real 60s, real 60s stuff. And uh, being French, uh, being a French thriller, they, they share something in common with, with the Bond movies in that life is cheap. Uh, OSS uh, 117 does, he's, he's not above just, you know, doing a guy in. Uh, you know, not, none, of the, none of these bad guys ever make it past the final reel. I mean, by the time of the end credits, every bad guy in the movie's dead, which, which is kind of cool. And the, and the fights and the action locations, it's, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. It's fun. You kind of have to watch it in the time period it's based in. And speaking of which, recently Jean Dujardin made some OSS 117 movies and uh, they're funny as hell. They're parodies. They're, very, they're like loving parodies of the original series. They're upset in the Cold War, uh, which makes it even more fun. And they, <laughs> the, 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 uh, Dujardin's version of the character is, is terrific. He's, he, he's a lot less charming than he thinks he is. Uh, you know, in a way that makes him more charming. Uh, he's very casually sexist. He's very casually racist, and you just can't hate him for it because he's in the time period. He's in the mindset of the time period, and and there's a lot of like his his cultural misunderstandings and things like that are where a lot of the laughs are drawn from. And of course, uh, because the, he's the buffoon in the story, uh, he gets a lot of grief. I mean, uh, you know, the the original character in the, in the straight up movies never had to put up with so many. Uh, scenes humiliating scenes as this character does it's it's kind of if you it, it, it's it's akin to a, sort of a gallic uh, get smart if you ever get a chance to see them um there he, ma he made two of them and they're both brilliant and they're both like laugh out loud funny just really good stuff and and what i like the most about them is is they uh they work really hard to stay in that period uh to the point where i, I you know, I, I've never been to North Africa in the 60s or to France in the 60s or South America in the 60s, but they, the locations they chose and the architecture and the costuming and everything else, it's just, okay, yeah, this is what it would have looked like. This is pretty cool. So uh, good job. Good job all around. Dorian at Roaring Steel Media. I admire that. You got your plug-in in the name. That's great. Okay. Do you have any favorite character gun car combinations that are signature to the character? For example, James Bond drives an Aston Martin and carries a Walther PPK. The Shadow has to have his dual 1911 45s, etc. If you, Chuck Dixon, had your own real life signature vehicle and firearm, what would it be? I'm going to go to Lone Wolf McQuaid. Um, his badass Ram Charger four wheel drive truck with the big fat knobby tires. You know, messy. Looks like he never cleaned the windshield. Uh, yeah, my wife will tell you this is my kind of car. It's driven by a slob hero. Uh, so me, slobby me, this is what I would drive. It's also the coolest car ever to be in a movie because it literally, McQuaid literally drives out of a grave in it. And he's buried alive. And this truck gets him out of it. Guns, no question. Big bore 44 Magnums. Dan Wesson is the... Uh, is the one that I prefer. That's my signature handgun. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a wheel gun man. So anyway, on that uh, explosive note, uh, check me out at brunobookstore.gmail.com. you got criticisms, responses, questions to ask. I'll answer them here. All you have to do is go to brunobookstore at gmail.com. That's it for this week, and I will see you all down the road. <laughs>